had a couple visits here this uh, this past week on on my uh, travels. This this last week was my uh, board of regents meeting on board of regents at Concordia Seminary, and uh, in August they do a board retreat, which I have come to learn basically means a meeting not where you usually meet. But that makes it a lot less fun. I, I, I had a, well, it was actually quite a lot of fun. But we met in a, the little town of Mapleton, Iowa. Uh, Mapleton is about an hour and 15 minutes from Omaha, kind of maybe almost straight east of Sioux City, something like that. Uh, you know, a lovely town of about a thousand people, something like that. And I have to admit, I was a little bit suspicious with us having our uh, board retreat. There, but this is really a remarkable place. You can uh, you can kind of kind of see their little prayer chapel there. This is a a farm that is uh, I mean it really is in the middle of nowhere, uh, cornfields. But um, it's a farm that is kind of the uh, center of um, I'll say of, of mission funding for the Luther Church Missouri Synod. Uh, it seems appropriate that it's at a farm in the middle of Iowa, um, but uh, but it is kind of a kind of a remarkable place. It's uh, it was started by this man, and the overalls here. His name's Gary Thies. Um, he's a retired banker, and about twenty some years ago, uh, kind of asked the question of, well, what can we do in in rural western Iowa to uh, to serve to serve the church and to serve the mission of the church and how we might uh, uh, care for our missionaries and everything and so we started uh, started this out of his home which is across the street eventually they moved into this uh, this farm and converted this barn to be it's basically a missionary museum they have artifacts from all over the world um, and what they do basically is he raises money for the Lutheran Church Missouri City missionaries not for the church as a whole but so, uh, for instance, if you wanted to uh, uh, to support Pastor Fro and his wife, you could write a you could write a check to LCMS, mail it to Mission Central, and flag it for Pastor Fro, and they'll just forward the check along. I mean, it's pretty not too complicated, frankly. Um, and it sounds like a, a lovely idea. They raised almost eight million dollars a year. Um, they have, yeah. This is us getting uh, about to get a tour of their uh, of their uh, their farm their farm farmer museum. Uh, you old uh, some of the old farmers appreciate. It. They had a John Deere um, they had a John Deere museum on one side, so they had the so they had the green on one side, and then they had the red in the next building. So we had uh, we kind of had them all covered. Uh, this is uh, President President Dale Meyer. Uh, president of the Seminary. Um, so they have, uh, here you can see another picture of them. Uh, they have 18 file cabinets full of, of uh, contacts that they, that they keep track of and that they write letters to and invite people to come in and here. And so they'll have missionaries, uh, when missionaries aren't furloughed, they'll come to this uh, little town in Iowa and they will have, they have like five or 6,000 visitors a year. They'll drive out to this place. And um, we'll get a tour, and we'll hear about the work that the church is doing all around the world, and we'll hear from these missionaries. Um, it really is uh, one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen in my life. It, it's really an amazing thing. Um, Gary writes 300 letters a week, dictates them, and he has 17 secretaries that transcribe all of these letters that he sends to donors. <laughs> about what's going on with, with their missionaries that they're supporting. And, uh, and I mean, it's just kind of exhausting to think about it here. I'm going to guess his early 70s, as I said, he's a retired banker. Um, everyone that is involved with this, from the, uh, uh, from the cooks to the transportation to all of the secretarial, everybody is volunteer. They have, they have no, um, they take no money at all for anything that they do. Everything is donated from uh, not only from the local community, it's probably centered in the upper Midwest, but, um, but really a remarkable 
remarkable place. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. You just kind of think of, uh, uh, you know, this would kind of, kind of be like cool California being the being the center of missions in the Western United States. I mean, that would sort of be the equivalent of making time. So, really, a remarkable place. I will try to, uh, uh, I'll try to make up something a little bit more detailed about this, uh, just because I. I looked at all of these, uh, uh, all of the things that they did. All of these volunteers, they have hundreds of volunteers to do all kinds of different, all kinds of different things, mailings, you know, everything. Things. We can do that. The reason we can't do that. For maybe not eight million dollars to do that, but we have lots of people that can do all kinds of remarkable things, and uh, and that's essentially how this started 20 years ago. Was this thing. I, uh, I can't be a, a missionary in Papua New Guinea, but I can tell them, I can tell the people about it, and, and, uh, and can kind of share that work. So it's really just a, a one of a kind, one of a kind place, and uh, he's a he is a uh, unique guy, that is for sure. I think he could, he could probably sell an Eskimo a freezer, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but really a, uh, a unique guy. Any questions or? or or kind of comments with this. As I said, that's just kind of a my impressionist painting of that uh, of that little uh, little trip. It was really quite a remarkable place. Um, before we get to our uh, our kind of topic topic at hand, I do want to introduce some of our dear friends, Jeff and Stephanie Zools. It looks like their uh, oldest uh, oldest son Rick is is here. The other three are with the uh, uh, the rest of the gang. They are some dear friends of ours from Kenosha. Um, their four children are close to the same age as our four children, so the 12 of us are kind of camping and doing all sorts of interesting things. We refer to ourselves as the Dirty Dozen. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you guys here. Are there any other announcements before we get to our uh, topic du jour here? Ah, you guys are, you know it makes me nervous when you're quiet. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a, a, a relatively kind of quick sketch of the uh, the convention that the Luther Church Missouri Synod held uh, in mid July in Milwaukee. Uh, the Luther Church Missouri Synod has a national convention every three years, and we elect delegates from our from our circuits. That all kind of meet together and get and get together and make decisions and have elections and do all of this work on behalf of our church. Uh, so Pastor, Pastor Schaff from um, from Grace and Grass Valley was our pastoral delegate. Uh, there was a layman from uh, First First uh, First Lutheran Placerville was our lay delegate. His name just completely blanked on me. Um, remember. I can't remember. Uh, Pastor Becker was the Sacramento Circuit Circuit delegate as well. So, um, so I didn't go this time, which was awesome. It was really quite fun to be able to sort of uh, watch it and not be doing things. That was awesome. Um, there are typically about 1,100 delegates somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, so you have a lay, pack, lay and a pastor delegate from each from each circuit. Uh, one of the really fun things about these conventions always going to the worship services uh, because if you gather 1,500 to uh, 2,500 Lutherans into one place, um, you're probably going to be loud. Not necessarily raucous. I mean, we're talking about Lutherans here. It'll be pretty ordered. But, um, uh, but it, it is really a, uh, a remarkable thing to go to, uh, to, go to a convention and, and then hear what's essentially the same services, the same liturgies that we do here, only kind of hear people from all over the world participating in this, uh, in this together. We get that at a little scale at our district convention, but this is really a, kind of a large scale. And they'll have a, they'll have a big choir that I'll meet, and, and uh, the, the service, the convention opens with a big community service, and uh, it's really a rather uh, complicated thing to figure out how to commune 2,000 people. Um, and to do so in a way, you know, you kind of think of, okay, so how do I do that, oh, Alter Guild? 
<laughs> set out 2,000 times. <laughs> yeah, so it it's really requires a tremendous amount of uh, tremendous amount of work. Plus, it's usually in a convention center, so it's not a it's not kind of your normal worship space. So you have to kind of baptize this space and figure out how to make it reference and to and to do so. Um, but they do a wonderful job. Uh, they use a lot of brass for uh, blast brass for instrumentation and uh, and such along the way. Um, probably the the two big things that happen at conventions in terms of decision making are elections and resolutions. Um, generally speaking, in my in my opinion, um, the elections are by far and away the most important thing. Um, resolutions uh, can easily kind of make people feel good and make people feel like they're doing something, but it is the actual people that are elected to do things that sort of that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. Um, but, you know, you don't have to pick one or the other. Um, so you have the election of synodical vice presidents. So we have a president of, of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, which is actually elected ahead of time. Each congregation elects him kind of by an electronic ballot a month before. But then we have all of the vice presidents that are elected. Um, first vice president, and then there are regional regional vice presidents. So we're a part of what's called the West Southwest region. Uh, and uh, Dr. Scott Murray, Pastor Scott Murray, is our regional vice president. We nominated him back in November or something like that. Um, and uh, and so each region has a vice president. They're nominated by their own region, but then the whole convention elects them because they're, they're not representatives of just that region, they're actually on the capital of the whole church. So these are all the, the kind of all of the incumbents were, um, were re-elected. The, the new one is um, Pastor Christopher Esgit, because there was a vacancy um, of the, uh, the vice president for the east, southeast region, uh, resigned partway through for health reasons. So he was appointed and then he was elected. Pastor Esgit um, was a year behind me in seminary. So his election as a regional vice president makes me feel old. <laughs> what can I say? Um, the other, uh, probably the other most significant election is, is the Secretary Senate. Secretary Senate is kind of the, uh, uh, he's the one that is the keeper of the, uh, of the handbook and handles a lot of the dispute resolution process, um, sits on the board of directors, there's all kinds of things. This position has tended over the decades uh, to be a lot less fluid than others. Usually a uh, secretary synodal will be there for 15 years, 25 years, you know, 30 years, a long time as a character. Yeah, like a, like a treasurer. Yeah. I'm not touching that either. Um, so they elected. Uh, so they elected a. Uh, uh, you know, if you're going to have someone who's 30 years, and you're going to elect someone. It's kind of helpful to elect someone who's relatively young, so they can actually do it for a long time. Uh, so they elected a relatively young man, probably 40, I'm going to guess, uh, Dr. John Sias, who's a who's a pastor in Montana. He was, uh, he was elected the new Secretary of Senate. Um, the, uh, the outgoing secretary had been doing it since 1998, I think, Dr. Ray Hartwig from, uh, uh, from South Dakota. And some of these names you may have heard at some point or another, but I, I think it's helpful for us to get at least a, sort of a big picture uh, questions of how these things, sort of what happens. And I'm not going to go through every election because you can read it if you're interested. Um, the other kind of elections that take place are the Senate Board of Directors. The Board of Directors are the ones that handle largely uh, the finance and properties of Senate. Um, the CPH Board of Directors, our publishing house. All of the seminaries and universities, the Board of Regents, all of those are elected. We have a Board for National Mission and a Board for International Mission that's elected. So there are a few positions Kind of, and not everybody on all of these boards is reelected every time. It's all sort of staggered, so there isn't any kind of massive, you know, sweep of something. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, two of the big ones for operating purposes 
becomes the CCM. Yes, which is not elected. Pardon? Which is not elected, but appointed. Right, but it's going to be appointed by right. those who are elected. Exactly, yep. Yeah. yeah, the Commission on Constitutional Matters, this is sort of kind of sort of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court. <laughs> of, the, of the, the church in terms of interpreting so, the bylaws. Your board of directors' elections really going to influence that because the mm -hmm. president of the Senate has the appointment, but he needs the approval of yep. the directors. Yes, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sias served on the Commission on Constitutional Matters before he, uh, before he was elected Secretary of Senate. So you have a number of these <laughs> positions that are, um, that are very important, but that you only hear about once every three years. <coughs> if you ever hear about them at all, <laughs> Which is also kind of a, kind of questionable. Um, the process of nominating and electing people to these positions is incredibly complex. I mean, it takes really two years prior to the convention, a year for sure, almost two years of sort of nominations and vetting of, of individuals because depending on the position, they may have to. Um, you know, they may have certain financial responsibilities that they have to oversee. I mean, it's just an incredibly complex process. And then it sort of all comes down to this group of 1,100 delegates looking at these two people and saying, okay, well, I like his picture, but I don't like his picture. <laughs> or, you know, or whatever. I mean, that, which honestly is kind of like any election anywhere, right? Is that you, it sort of comes down to you can spend as much or as little time in researching the candidates as you like. Um, that's, uh, you know, and that's kind of both the good and the bad of a, of a democratic process. Uh, so there are, I'm going to say, approximately 40, maybe 45 positions in total that are, that are elected. Most of them are for uh, six-year terms. Some of them are for three-year terms. So those are kind of the lengths of time that these elections take place. Does anybody have any questions? Just kind of either process or any particular things you have back. Is the, is the trend shifting away from liberalism and mainline churches or towards it? Um, I would say, and, and using any kind of, uh, any, any time that we talk about, um, uh, I'll, I'll say labels in the church, we always try to find some way of kind of grabbing onto things that make sense, which means that we tend to gravitate toward political labels, you know, conservative, liberal, that sort of that sort of thing. And then kind of kind of sort of fits, but kind of sort of doesn't fit. Um, I would say that uh, the way that I would was that I would Yeah, there you go. The way that I would put that put that is that the people that were elected at this convention um, are very supportive of President Harrison's approach to the church, and yeah, which I count as a very good thing because I think he's a very fine and faithful president. Um, and that almost without exception, these elections reflected his leadership. That's how I would, that's how I would put it. Yes? Another way is to look at how much they hold one to the Bible as the word of God, and second of all, as the confessions as an true interpretation of the Bible. Sure. And so, you know, the one word way is to say the shift is more confessional. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. I would say that that is certainly, uh, that is certainly true. It is, uh, again, just like in our American political process, very tricky even to kind of wrap your brains around understanding those questions far less those answers, because if I can sort of uh, uh, get away from my dragnet just the facts <laughs> and, uh, and move slightly toward editorializing for just a moment, um, what tends to happen in, in our church body is that if I, if I think that um, Pastor Meyer ought to be the president of the California Nevada Hawaii District, because I'm mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to do more, okay? If I think that, um, and I start telling other people that, I think he'd be a fantastic president of our district. And I start telling other people that, what am I going to be accused of? 
politicking, right? That's politicking. But if I think that he would be a fantastic district president because he's a good and faithful pastor and he would do a good job, and I refuse to tell people that, now what am I doing? <laughs> I am being uh, unwise. <laughs> so it, it really is a challenge, in all seriousness. It is a challenge in our church body to think through how do I, as a, you know, kind of Joe Schmo sitting sitting with the ballot, how do I evaluate these these candidates on what kind of job they're doing? Other than simply with you know the little biographical information that I have, which probably doesn't tell me uh, a whole lot that's useful. So it's a, I mean, in all seriousness, it is a real pickle for our for our church body as a whole to think about how to do elections. Because if I if I tell other people I think this guy would be great or this lady would be excellent for this or that position, then I'm kind of accused of being politic. If I don't tell, tell people, then I'm then I'm really kind of being. I'm just saying I don't care, <laughs> frankly. Um, so it's a it's a challenge. There's no no doubt about it. Um, and that has been the challenge in our church for at least seventy five years. Yeah. Are these like full time paid positions for these people? Or are they um, it varies. Like all of those. Um, if we if we go back. Uh, to this list of synodical vice presidents. The first vice president is full time. All of these regional vice presidents are not. All of those are part time. These are all, <clears throat> these two men are retired, but, but Pastor Esgit, Pastor Neuer, and Pastor Murray are all parish pastors in different places. So these are all part time positions. <laughs> Just like I'm on the Board of Regents at Concordia Seminary, I don't get paid for it. Guarantee you that, <laughs> um, and and you know that. So that's not a paid position; that's a volunteer position. Yeah, Never just like the rest of the church. Their <laughs> flight, their meals, right. expenses will be paid for, expenses. but not uh, typically. So most of the elected positions are um, are volunteer positions, but like the secretary of Cinnabon, that's full time. So so he'll have to move to St. Louis and. You know, kind of do do all of these things. I would say that the majority of the elections that take place, though, are for those volunteer, really more supervisory positions, being on a board, you know, on a board of directors or board of regents or something like that. It's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions, kind of about like, either about elections or any particular things that you're that you're interested in learning about? Yeah. So, out of curiosity, for those paid positions, how is there? Well, that's, that is always a magically complex question, not too surprising. Um, because are you, do you use a pay scale that is based on the congregational participation? So kind of, it's like any anytime you're talking about scale, you're gonna be looking at, all right, what are parallel positions, similar positions to what, they're, uh, to what they use? Um, and and these positions typically aren't um, aren't really parallel to what a parish pastor does. So almost without exception, I'm sure that there are exceptions, but almost without exception, they're probably going to get paid more than most parish pastors do. Um, but that they're also almost certainly going to get paid less, maybe even dramatically less than what a secular parallel. Would be. You know, so um, so I think I don't know. This is all a matter of a uh, of public record. Um, I think that the president is in it. Probably his salary is probably in the couple hundred thousand dollar range. You know, somewhere in that neighborhood, which is certainly more than most parish pastors make. Um, but if you were the if you were the the head of a uh, corporation that had between. Ten and fifty thousand employees getting paid two hundred thousand dollars would be absurd. <laughs> so it's uh, that that's the that really is the, the trick with that, and I don't have a brilliant answer to that. The same is true for educational positions, 
um, you know, what is the president of one of our Concordias made? Well, I guarantee it's more than a, you know, than a parish pastor, but that it is almost certainly less than a secular counterpart. Okay. So that, that's kind of how I would try to look at it. And, if, and it's a matter of trying to find a balance that's reasonable, that isn't a burden on either on the church or on the individuals, which is not, you know, pretty much means somebody's going to be happy, or unhappy all the time. Good, good question. Very good question. That goes with the sermon. Yeah. Right. Are you unhappy with the sermon? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just pushed in the soul wall. Get funding. Um, there are a number of revenue streams, but by far the majority of the synod's funding comes ultimately from congregations. So uh, a congregation sends uh, sends a uh, an offering typically to the district, and then the district gives a percentage of their uh, of their uh, offerings to to the synod. So that's kind of the. That it varies. In, it varies from district to district. So you'll have some districts that um, uh, that will give either nothing or almost nothing, and you'll have other districts that will give fifty percent or more. That, that really varies from district to district. Ours is our district is closer to the nothing than to the fifty percent. I don't know. I couldn't give you exactly. Any other questions, just kind of big picture about uh, about elections or about sort of how some of this stuff works? Yeah. This is, I know this is, these are things that are sort of removed from us on a week-to-week -week basis, but I think it's helpful for us as a church body to kind of understand how these things work and why they work. It's just yeah. Really That's a surprise to me that our district is closer to the nothing. How in the world could that be? Well, I, I, I don't know the history behind that, so I don't have any. I, I think, maybe Pastor, you know, you know the answer. I think it's probably more like maybe 10 or 15 percent of our total offerings. But a, a lot of times, I mean, you think of, think of how budgets work at a congregational level. And you look at a budget, you know, we're getting close to budget time here, so we'll be doing this. You look at a budget, and you kind of look at a number and scratch your head and think, how did we come up with that number? And you know that may be a history that goes back 25 years, based on who knows what. <laughs> um, there may be very concrete reasons for it. The goal, generally speaking, is to make the budget reflective of of, of not the unspoken or you know the unknown oral history of why do we give this number, and closer to the actuals. Of what are, what are the needs and how to, and, a, and making a real spending plan, but those numbers vary dramatically from district to district. They really do. Sometimes uh, that decision making process, I'll say, how do I how do I say this? Sometimes that decision making process is more political than I than I personally think is helpful. Um, so if I don't like what is happening at the synod. You know, I as the district, uh, really as the district board of directors, the district is the board of directors, the ones that make those decisions. If I don't like what's happening at the Senate, then I'm not going to be very motivated to increase our giving to the Senate. Right? And so, and so that sometimes that money can be used as a political tool, which I am not really a big fan of, frankly. I don't think that's a good way to operate. That's for Meyer and then it's great. Before the current administration, um, our district gave 25% of all receipts directly to the city. When I was on the board of directors as regional vice president and budget time came, that number was decreasing for various reasons and the churches don't think it's helpful for us to know. When I left the board of directors, it was between 10 and 15 yeah. Yeah. And I think it stayed about there since. That would be my guess, somewhere in that neighborhood. I mean, and that would be, it would be interesting to kind of do the same sort of process looking at our district as well. Okay. But that's beyond what we're doing here. In two years, we have elections. Right. We can talk about that. 
Um, if there are no other questions, either, I'm sorry, there's another hand. Rick, please. I guess, uh, first of all, I want to assure the congregation we are not in that position of just not knowing where our budget figures come. So in November, when I stand in front of you with the budget, <laughs> I will be able to assure you that I can tell you exactly where those numbers come from. I have no doubt. And those numbers are based purely on exactly what we need based on paying somebody something. Um, in, there were days that we had a budget where we could actually say, well, we'd like to give a little bit more to education and we're going to put more money there. We're not in that shape. Now we're going, our, our school supplies cost X, our pencils cost X, that's what we're asking for. That's what we're asking for. And that is the way that a budget should work. And second of all, uh, every year the Lutheran Witness actually puts out a list, and you can look at there, and I'd advocate you do that, which actually details every district's giving all the way up the food chain. Yeah. It's an interesting process. Indeed. So thank you. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Mr. Administrator, appreciate it. Um, the next big topic is the topic of fellowship. One of the things that happens um, at conventions, and honestly, this is possibly the most uh, the most enjoyable part of the Synod Convention, is that uh, is that we have Lutheran church bodies all around the world that we have worked with. In some cases, that we have kind of planted. As you know, our missionaries have gone and have, and have helped train indigenous pastors in an area, so that a, so that a church is, is kind of more grown up in that area, and and so we have the the privilege of going through the process of being in doctrinal agreement with these other churches, and then declaring that we are in pulpit and offer fellowship with them. This is really a lot of fun. Um, typically, it's somewhere. Uh, at least in the last few conventions, it's been somewhere between five and ten church bodies. Uh, some of them are quite large. Some of them are much are much smaller. These are all of the representatives of the various uh, of the various church bodies that are present at the convention. Um, and it, it, as I said, it's really quite a quite a lot of fun, and it it shows us as a as a church as a synod. Where it is that our um, that our work kind of bears fruit very often. Um, one of the uh, one of those uh, pastors is uh, uh, Archbishop of the Lutheran Church in Nigeria, and I only pulled him out because he was in the class that I taught at Fort Wayne uh, back in June. So I saw that picture and said, "I know that guy," <laughs> which is kind of uh, which is kind of cool. So so the church bodies that we um, either declared fellowship with. Or we're kind of established as an independent church body. Those are kind of the two big categories. Because let's say we have a mission that's taking place in a country. And that mission has been going on for a number of years. There are indigenous pastors that are being in place. And so this church is kind of built up. At some point, uh, we want to say, we're no longer missionaries in your country. You are your own church. And we'll, and we'll help you in what ways you want. I mean, because we don't want to sort of uh, parallel imperialism, essentially. We don't want to have an international Lutheran church in the same, you know, in that kind of sense. So you have these churches, uh, Norway, Uruguay, Guatemala, Venezuela. Um, I don't even know where. All right, so that, that must be an area in Kazakhstan and, uh, and the Church of the Republic of Chile. So these are, uh, these are the ones that I kind of, kind of pulled out. A lot of times, what these are, uh, like the Lutheran Church in Norway, uh, Norway is another one of these countries where historically Norway was was almost entirely Lutheran. Um, but the state church, uh, but in Norway, the Lutheran Church is run by the state, which is also the case in Germany and, uh, and you know a number of European countries. And those state churches. Uh, oftentimes uh, become completely accommodating to the culture. They're not, um, they're, they're barely recognizable as Christian in some cases. And so a smaller Lutheran church will kind of grow up in one of these places. So this, this Lutheran church in Norway is an example of that. An independent Lutheran church in the, in the country of Norway. And you'll find these in, in 
many of these other places as well. And, that's, and oftentimes this work uh, is the result of decades and decades of, of, uh, of work, of planting, of sending missionaries, pastors, teachers, deaconesses, you know, lay people, whatever it is. And so this is sort of the culmination of all that work that happened. So it's really a lot of fun. I've, I've always enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that part, maybe more than anything else. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Well, because we're already in fellowship with them. This is declaring. This is declaring fellowship for the first time. We're in. Yeah, we're in fellowship with I don't know dozens and dozens of churches all over the world. Um, but uh, but yeah, these are the ones that we are for the first time declaring fellowship. Yes. Thank you. Good question. Very good question. Other thoughts or questions? All right, Jeff. So how often do they uh, do they vote for fellowship and what's the process? Um, there are kind of two processes that take place. And it, it depends a lot on the it depends a lot on the size of the church body. So um, so if we take this Lutheran Church of Norway, um, that's a uh, that's a, a relatively small church body. I, don't, I can't tell you how big it is. I don't know anything about it directly. Um, but it's a relatively small church body. We actually authorized the president of the Senate, I think in 2010, uh, to be able to declare um, provisional fellowship with smaller church bodies like this, uh, pending kind of ratification by the Senate convention. I'm sure that that's what happened with, with the Lutheran Church in Norway. With larger churches, um, and so that means that we'll send uh, someone that's that's a part of the uh, it's called church relations um, that will that will go to that country and will begin to have uh, theological conversations with them and it kind of is a is will we a, kind of send pastors there? Yeah, we may we may send pastors there. They may they may come here. You know, there's going to be back and forth. Sometimes there will be. Uh, a sharing of uh, teachers at the seminaries for a while, and, and it's sort of a process of us getting to know each other, and and in some cases, uh, again, it, it, we're kind of involved directly with them being planted in the first place, so we kind of know them from the very beginning. Um, with larger church bodies, um, it's it's much more time consuming. So, for instance, the largest. Lutheran Church in the world, single country Lutheran Church in the world, is Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia has like eight and a half million members. So it's four times the size of the Lutheran Church in the very center. Been there for a long time. It's a very, you know, they have a long history. Um, kind of getting, getting to know each other in a context like that is going to take a long time, years. Because uh, you're not just looking at what, what does something say on a piece of paper, but what, what does the church actually practice? What do they do? What do they believe? How does that kind of take place at a congregational level? So that so I believe, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to be wrong on this, but I believe that we are not in fellowship with the Lutheran Church in Ethiopia um, because for many years uh, they were a part of the Lutheran World Federation. The Lutheran World Federation is this kind of pan uh, Lutheran uh, group that is extremely, um, to use the political term, I guess, is extremely liberal. Um, that that um, that is fully supportive, for instance, of women's education and of of a homosexual agenda, and they're they're going to have all kinds of stipulations in the way the Lutheran World Federation has used that is that they have kind of tied their giving money to these churches to whether or not the churches will support their, their kind of theopolitical agenda. So there are lots of these churches around that look at these things, especially in Africa, which tends to be uh, quite conservative, both socially and theologically. Um, there are these churches all over the place that are like, well, um, we don't like these things. We don't, we don't agree with what's going on, but um, we are, uh, poor, very poor. We need the resources. We need to be able to feed our people, and so they're kind of stuck in between this, these situations, and so it, that's why these become so complex. Yeah. In with Ethiopia, you have more than one church body. 
and one right. church body we are in fellowship with. They're mainly uh, that part of Ethiopia known as Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, their process of coming in was not only sending pastors here to our seminaries, us visiting with them, but when we thought that they were about ready, we reviewed everything through this commission. Now it's the Commission on Theology and Church, Church Relations. Relations. Yeah. After that doctoral review and the dialogue, and in a sense, educational exchange, they then were recommended for fellowship. Right. And the president put them forth before a convention yeah. in 2005. Yeah, that sounds about right. Four. I mean, four. Four. Sorry. So, yeah, and, that's, yeah, yeah. and that's an example of kind of how these processes take place. Um, any other questions on those, on those, kind of that whole process and what happens there? Um, the other big thing that happens are resolutions. So this is, you know, I feel like we need to have one of those schoolhouse rock videos for those of us <laughs> certain age that remember them from the 70s, you know, how do you make a bill? <laughs> how did something become a law? Um, so, so you have a process where congregations can submit an overture uh, to its circuit or to its district or to the synod as a whole, and then you have a group of people that uh, serve on what are called four committees that sort of gather all of these overtures together and look at them and say, yes, 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 We've already dealt with that. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and have to figure out how to address every overture that comes in. And so again, that's a very complex process. And you have these four committees that, that have to sort of make sense of all of these things. In 2013, when I was a delegate, I was on, uh, on one of the four committees. I was the secretary for one of the four committees, which meant lots of paperwork. <laughs> um, this time, I think in the past there typically have been eight or nine four committees. In order to make it so that everyone had less work, uh, the Senate president essentially doubled the number of four committees. So that you had people that had a lot less, a much more focused area that they could work on. So instead of education, which would mean elementary, high school, colleges, and seminaries, you have a four committee that deals with seminaries, and one that deals with colleges, and one that deals with and, and so it was much more focused. A little harder to follow that way, but um, much more focused. I just want to hold up a couple of the resolutions that I, that I think are the most significant along the way. And I should, and I should mention that um, I didn't uh, kind of make all of this stuff up on my own. I kind of gleaned uh, a lot of this. As I said, I was not a delegate, so I wasn't physically there for this. I gleaned a lot of this information from a couple of pastor friends of mine. Uh, one's name is Jacob Sutton, who's a pastor in Fairfoot in Indiana. And then the other is uh, Pastor Peter Ill, who is a pastor at Millstadt, Illinois. Um, so the first one, some of these things may seem like they're kind of mom and apple pie, obvious, but, um, but not so much sometimes. So one resolution called 602, 6-02, to uphold the scriptural and confessional qualifications for the office of the Holy Ministry. So, uh, so what this one did is, is not complicated, but simply held up what our church body has always, uh, has always confessed and held up, and that is that the Bible tells us what the qualifications for being a pastor are. I can't make it up. <laughs> and I can't just decide to ignore them if I don't like them. Yeah. Um, and so looking at the, um, uh, both the scriptures and our Lutheran confessions, particularly the Augsburg Confession, um, this one quite, quite simply held that uh, this is what it means to be a pastor. And these are the qualifications for it. Um, the reason that that is important uh, is because of the next one. And this was probably the most <coughs> controversial one that was dealt with. Yes, Barbara. After the one that we yes. had, mm -hmm. how in the world would only be 80% that agree with this? That's saying 20% either that's, aren't saying or they did not feel like that. You know, that's a good, that's a good question. 
I remember when I was a delegate in 2004, so this was you know, a dozen years ago, delegate at a convention. Um, uh, the, the then uh, president of the Senate wanted us to uh, uh, have resolutions be 100%. That he wanted us to have unanimous resolutions. Well, this is, uh, this is kind of, um, uh, Lutherans are a stubborn lot sometimes. I don't know if you know that. And so we had a resolution like commending the Northwest District for, uh, uh, for making quilts. And it didn't pass. <laughs> or it didn't pass 100%. It was like 99%. It's like, how can you be opposed to people making quilts? <laughs> sometimes, if you tell me I have to do something, <laughs> people will just say no. So that's, that's kind of always how those things work in conventions. I'm really not trying to belittle that. Um, but it may also be that there are people that looked at this and said, I don't agree with how this is worded. I'm not saying that the concept is wrong, but I don't agree with how it's worded, so I can't vote for it. That's that sort of thing. And it may also be that you have people that let, looked at this and, and are going to say, well, I guess, but I also know that uh, that what happens uh, because of this resolution, they don't like the consequences for it. Yeah, and, so, that has to do with the next and that has to do with the next one. And I can see that there is no possible way that I can finish this in the next 10 seconds before the rest of the kids come in. So I will start this briefly, and then we'll wrap this up next week. Um, this is probably the most, uh, the most contested one, and has to do with uh, what's called licensed lay deacons involved in words and sacrament ministry. So in 1989, our church body authorized what were called licensed lay deacons. So it would say that uh, a district president can authorize a man, a pastor, uh, you know, a layman, to act as a pastor in a given congregation as a licensed lay deacon. I mean, that's kind of the super short word. And there could be lots of reasons behind that. A lot of times it was because of distance, and because of a, a, a real or perceived pastoral shortage. Uh, this is 1989, and this has been a bone of contention in our church body since then. Um, because you have people serving as pastors who are not trained as pastors, who haven't had the education of a pastor, who haven't, and who aren't called to be pastors and aren't ordained as pastors. They haven't been certified by a seminary faculty of the days, a licensed lady gets. And uh, so this has been going on for about 18 years or something. No, longer than that, almost 30 years, like 89, 99. And, and this resolution seeks to resolve that dilemma. And this was, without a doubt, the most controversial topic. And so that's what we'll take up next week. <laughs> and on that final topic, yes? Do you have any final word? I have one more uh, uh, request. <laughs> this has to do with the flowers of the church. Um, we used to have quite a nice supply of vases, vases, uh, for you to put your flowers in and take them home. Well, we have gone home, but they haven't made their way back again. So if you happen to have one of those vases in your home that you used to take flowers on, maybe you could bring them back. Kind of short. Any flow on them? Where should they put them if they bring them back? Put them in the kitchen, all, all you'll, you'll grab them. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Diane. Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.